All right, well, if you're new with us, we've been in the book of Matthew for a bit of time, and recently we've been looking at some parables asking this question that Jesus actually answers through the parables, what is the kingdom of God like? Now, we know what the kingdom of this world is like, and yet we as followers of Jesus are called to seek another kingdom, to seek the kingdom of God first. So Jesus says, here's what it's like. And in the book of Matthew, it says it's the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven used interchangeably. And so this is very practical for us if you're a follower of Jesus. What is it that you're to be in pursuit of? What is it that should be guiding you? What should you be seeking? It's the kingdom of God. It's King Jesus. Last week, we saw that the kingdom of God was like a mustard seed. So we learned from that that we should never despise the small things because the kingdom of God often begins small and then grows. And he goes on to say the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. So we should never despair the slow process. Like leaven, it's a slow process as it moves through the whole lump, but eventually permeates everything. Today in our passage, we see three more parables. They're the shorter parables, maybe the parables that are a little easier to wrap our minds around. Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 52 will be our text. And I'm going to invite you to stand with me. I'm going to read it. You're invited to read along if you'd like or follow as I read. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls and and upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind and when it was filled... They drew it up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous, and will throw them into the furnace of fire in that place. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm going to invite you to just bow with me in prayer and ask God the Holy Spirit to teach us each individually. Father God, thank you for your word. It's eternal, it's, it's true, it's authoritative, and we look to you, the power of your Holy Spirit, the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, that he would teach each one of us. Lord, the implications of these words for our lives Uh, Lord, that it would not just be information, but it would actually be transformation of our lives as we seek you, Jesus, as we seek your kingdom first. Amen. You can be seated. So I'm actually going to approach this text uh, a little bit backwards. I want to begin with this parable of the dragnet. And again, it's a very common image to these people along the Sea of Galilee. There was a couple different ways that people would fish through casting a net out from the boat or dispersing a dragnet from the land. And as it says, it would be dispersed. And as it was pulled to the land, it would gather fish. So it's pretty self-explanatory. All kinds of fish were caught in the net as it was drugged towards the shore. So when they got on shore, as you can see in Jesus' words, they had to be sorted out. There were the keepers, and uh, we'll just call them the not keepers, right? Verse 50 says that the angels will then take the not keepers, And we'll throw them into the furnace of fire. And 
a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And if you were with us a couple weeks ago, you recognized that phrase that we used in another parable, wasn't it? It was used in the parable of the wheat and the tares. The exact same words, going back a few verses, where it says in the wheat and the tares, as you can see there, the angels will gather the tares from the wheat, and again, they will be thrown into the furnace of fire. Exact same words in that place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that gives us a bit of a clue that you see those same words used, so Jesus is maybe teaching some of the same things through a different image, which is frankly a great teaching method. Same truth, a different method. And if you were with us, we made four points from that parable of the wheat and the tares, and I just want to remind you of what they were because we see some similarities. We talked about the constant reality of evil in the world. We talked about that confusing reality of evil and that the wheat and the tares looked a lot of the same and these good fish and the bad fish, they're all together in this one place. We talked about the certainty of judgment. But maybe the challenging part of that parable, at least for me, was recognizing that that judgment is delayed till the end. And we see some of these same principles surface in this parable as well, but I would highlight particularly points two and three, that we see Jesus maybe emphasizing that same point that the good fish and the bad fish are all together for a period of time and that ultimately there's a certainty of the separation, there's a certainty of the judgment. So to say it another way, the good fish exist together with the not good fish and in the end God will sort out the good fish from the not good fish but in the midst of that I never want to imply that somehow some people are just innately good and others innately bad, because what does Scripture say? Yeah, Scripture says all have sinned and fall short. Scripture says there is none who are righteous. Scripture says nobody seeks after God, that our righteousness could be compared to what? Filthy rags. It's of no value. So, so we don't want to make this parable mean more than Jesus intended or to say something that's contrary to Scripture. So I won't spend too much time in this parable because it comes down to this. The good fish exist together in the water with the not good fish. The wheat exists with the tares together in this world, the good with the evil. God will sort out the good fish from the not good fish. God sorts out the wheat from the tares. That's his job, amen? Amen. And he does it in his way at his time. Now, as I thought about fishing, I thought of my own experience in fishing. How many of you like to fish? Yeah. I call myself a fair weather fisherman. I know some of you will go out and fish at any weather, endure anything, not so much me. A beautiful day, I'll go out and fish. And growing up in Colorado, I actually fished a lot, and there were rivers that we'd fish, but I, I liked the lakes because the lakes were easy, right? And we would fish with bobbers. Some of you are going, oh, that's not even fishing, is it? But you know how it is. You throw it out there, and there's the bobber sitting out there, and, and you can just chill and relax and as soon as that bobber goes down, now what do you do? You got to fish. So you set the hook. Now in these lakes where we'd fish, there's all kinds of fish in there. There's the good fish, there's the keepers, and then there's the what? The not so good fish. And you don't really know what you have on when you set that hook, but I remember times where I'd set the hook and man, this was a big fish. You can tell pretty quick, can't you? because that, that, that rod is bent and you're reeling it in and you grab the net because as soon as it gets up close, you don't want to lose it. And so you're reeling it in, you know you got a big fish and you get it in the net and, ah, oh, it's not a good fish. It's not, it's not a keeper. And so what that meant for us there fishing, and actually I don't know all about that much about fishing here, but it was often a, what we would call a sucker. 
or sometimes called a carp. You ever seen them? Ugly fish. They're just the ugliest sort of fish you've ever seen. They're actually bottom feeder, feeders, and uh, they're full of bones, and um, I guess a few people eat them. We never did. We just put them with all the other bad fish, and that was not back in the water. They went the way of all bad fish. Um, I'll let you fill in the blank there, whatever that meant to you. There are all kinds of people in the world. And in the end, Jesus determines the wheat and the tares. In the end, Jesus determines the good fish, the bad fish. And it's all a response to Jesus himself. Here's it. Here's the deal, church. We need to learn to leave the sorting to who? To God. And as we learned when we dealt with the wheat and the tares, some of us need to give God his job back. Because we've gotten into the sorting, we've gotten into the judging, and really what we should do is cast the net, amen, and bring in what we can, and we'll trust God to sort out the rest. So I want to spend the rest of our time looking at these two other parables. It's a parable of a hidden treasure, it's the parable of a merchant seeking pearls, and Somebody had called these parables parables twins because they're very similar, but they're not identical twins, are they? They're what I would call fraternal twins. But did you notice the difference? I'm just going to lay out the difference, and I'm going to let you sort out the difference, and I'm going to take the easy part of the story, all right? Here's the difference. This man who found this hidden treasure found the hidden treasure randomly. He was somehow digging whether he was plowing a field or something, and he stumbles across this hidden treasure. But not so with the pearl. There was a man who was actually seeking fine pearls, and he found a fine pearl that was of great value, and so one was very random, one was very purposeful. What's the significance of that? I'll let you answer that yourselves. Our life group will be chewing on that idea just a little bit. But here's what I want to do. I want to take the easy part. (laughs) I'm going to leave you the hard part and sorting that out. Here's the easy part. There's three words that surface in this parable that help us sort it out. Three words. Read them with me. Worth, joy, and sacrifice. Both of these parables have those concepts in them. Let's just talk about that. First of all, the first parable has a treasure. Now, you could wonder, why was there treasure buried in the ground? But actually, that would be pretty common in Israel. Because if you know history, Israel was a constant battlefield. So when an enemy would be coming in or they were expecting an invasion, what would they do with their valuables? They would bury them in the ground. They would put them in some sort of a box or some sort of a clay pot, and they would bury them, hoping that after the invaders had gone through and if they were still alive, they could come back and they could dig up their treasure. So it was not uncommon for people to dig up treasure in Israel. I read a story of a a boy who remembers going to family reunions in Union County, South Carolina. And at the end of every meal, all the cousins would get shovels and they would go out through the land to dig up the family treasure. Because at some point in history, they knew they'd buried their treasure during the midst of the Civil War and nobody had ever found it. And they didn't either. Let's all get our shovels. Go dig up that treasure. This treasure in the parable was found. Now, there's a lot we don't know, and evidently we don't need to know who buried it, how long it would, had been buried, or for what reason it was buried. But it had great worth. How do we know this treasure had great worth? Because the finder of it was willing to sell everything else that he had in order to buy the field and acquire that treasure. The pearl. Pearls are valuable even today, even more so back then. I read this week 
that 10 years ago a Filipino fisherman found a pearl worth $100 million. You know how big it was? It weighed 75 pounds, 26 inches long, 12 inches around. Can you imagine the oyster that that came out of? That would be terrifying just to find the oyster. <laughs> now, we don't know what made the pearl that this man found of, what, of great worth. Maybe it was the size, maybe it was its purity. Back in that day, pearls were not easy to come by. They didn't have all the things that we would use today. I understand we harvest pearls. We grow oysters to get the pearl. But in those days, if you're going to, to find a pearl in the water at about 40 feet, you would actually take a large rock and tie it to your waist <laughs> so you could get down there and have just enough time to find some oysters that had a pearl and then hopefully get back up to the top. The seeker of pearls found a pearl of great value, of great worth. How do we know it was of great worth? Because he as well was willing to get rid of everything else in his life to acquire that one pearl. What's the second word? Joy. Joy. I love that phrase, from joy over it. He sells everything he has to find that treasure. Now, I've never found a treasure. The closest I got, I guess, to a treasure was after my mom had died and I was going through the stuff, I discovered that my dad had a coin collection. Did I get excited? I was really excited about that. So I started doing all the research, but it was not worth much. Both of the people in the parable, no doubt, were thrilled in finding the pearl, were thrilled in finding the treasure. The word joy there could be translated delight. It's connected with the word rejoice or, or to be, be glad. Scripture speaks often about joy, and Scripture tells us we can be joyful even in bad circumstances, but this is not bad circumstance, is it? It's a great circumstance. This person, both of them were filled with joy because of the treasure they had found, because of the worth of it. So we have worth and joy, and then we have sacrifice. Both the parables have this phrase. Look at it. He goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. He went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. There was a sacrifice of everything else to acquire the treasure, to acquire the pearl. They were both willing to joyfully sacrifice everything else. They recognized the worth. They had great joy, and it's critical, church, that we connect the joy and the sacrifice together. Because when you hear the word sacrifice, is it a positive word usually? It's usually not. Usually in our minds, when we think of a sacrifice, it's something we have to sacrifice. This was not the case here. It was what kind of a sacrifice? It was a joyful sacrifice, a willing sacrifice, not any begrudging, resentful sort of idea that I have to get rid of all my stuff for this. It was they would do it over and over and over again. So three concepts. Read those words with me again, please. Worth, joy, sacrifice. What are the implications of those? in our lives that come out of these parables. I want to suggest to you that these parables are like a diagnostic that can examine our hearts. You know, if your car's not running quite right, you can take it in and they'll plug it in and they'll say, here's what's wrong. And these parables are beautiful as I thought about them in my own life that kind of reveal really what's going on inside. So I want to explore that in the remaining time that we have the impl implications of those concepts that come out of these parables. Worth. 
Let me ask, what is really valuable to us? What is of great worth to you right now in your life? Your spouse? Certainly. Your children? Your grandchildren? Those are all great things and very valuable. I even think of our health. We don't recognize how valuable our health is until what? (laughs) We lose it. I lost eyesight in one of my eyes, and man, I recognize it's really nice to be able to see out of both eyes. Certainly all of those things are things of great worth. But as you explore Scripture, you see something else emphasized besides those things. You see the vast worth of Jesus. You see the vast worth and value of the kingdom of God. So let me show you some other passages that use these ideas of wealth and value. The Apostle Paul prays for the believers in Colossae. Look what he prays. He prays that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to what? Read it. All the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden what? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Scripture says that's of great worth. This King Jesus and all that can be found in him. The Apostle Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 1, 7 that our faith itself is what? more precious than gold. Do we see it that way? That's what Scripture says. The Apostle Paul reflects on his ministry and his life, and he says, to me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles what? Read it. The unfathomable riches of Christ. So that's the blessing I have to present to something of to to present to people something of great worth. And then the Apostle Paul says this, that we have this treasure, referring to Christ himself, in earthen vessels. So I just want you to see that from a biblical perspective, the thing that is of greatest worth, repeated over and over again, the thing that is more precious than gold, the thing that is a treasure, is Jesus himself and the kingdom that he brought that we're encouraged to pursue. So let me ask, how valuable is Jesus and his kingdom to you? Don't answer that too quick. Boy, you just have to ponder that a little bit. How valuable, of what worth do I put on Jesus and his kingdom work on the planet now? If we answer that too quickly, because no doubt all of us would say, well, I greatly value Jesus. I I greatly value the kingdom of God. And yet these other two words might cause us to think differently. So let's consider this second word, joy. Same question. What do you find great joy in? What really gets you excited? What makes you glad? What makes you rejoice? A blazer win? Not much going on there right now. (laughs) A job promotion? Yeah, we'll get excited about that. A a clean bill of health when you come back from an important procedure? A child's accomplishment? Those are all good things. Nothing wrong with rejoicing in any of that. But let me ask, how do you feel emotionally, even your emotive response when Jesus is talked about, when there's opportunities to pour yourself into the kingdom work of God, is there that same sort of excitement? The Apostle John speaks often about joy. These things, he says, I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be what? Be made full. He says it again, until now you've not asked anything 
You've not asked for nothing. You've asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be what? Full. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Those are the sort of things that uh, Scripture refers to this complete joy, this fullness of joy that's found in Jesus and his kingdom work. The Apostle Paul says it a bit differently. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and what? Joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what the kingdom of God is about. Joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. And then he says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Do you see what scripture says we should find joy in? It's in the kingdom of God and this work that he's doing in us. So there's a connection as we see our lives evaluated by Scripture between joy and worth. Could it be that our joy, our excitement about Jesus reflects or is equal to the worth we find in him? And maybe we don't really get excited about the things of God because we really don't value it like Scripture says we should. Or we value other things more highly. What we find is that joy in our lives is directly related to the value that we see in Jesus. Not the value we place on other things in the world because those are fleeting. The last word is what? Sacrifice? So let me ask, evaluate, what do we, what will we sacrifice for? For what would we sell all that we have to acquire? For what would we make a financial commitment? For what would we make a time commitment? Sure, we'd sacrifice for our families and our children. We do that all the time. And parents, we usually do that with great joy, at least most of the time. We have a lot of babies coming in our church family, which I'm thrilled about, and I say congratulations. Parents, here's what you need to know, though. The latest report is it will cost you almost $250,000 to just get them out the door. That's a sacrifice. A quarter of a million dollars just to raise these guys and get them out the door. This doesn't include college at all. You are about ready to make a joyful sacrifice. <laughs> Financially, you're going to sacrifice a bit of sleep. You're going to sacrifice a bit of freedom. But do you do it joyfully? Probably, as you should. Many people sacrifice family, though, for jobs, huge amounts of time, for status, for self-satisfaction. We are a culture that sacrifices tons of money for our hobbies and our recreation and our entertainment. But let me just ask, the same thing I have to ask myself, what have each of us joyfully sacrificed for the kingdom work of God? Have we sacrificed any time commitment? Or have we fit the kingdom work of God into all of our margins? Have we made any financial sacrifice for the kingdom work of God? Or do we give to the kingdom work of God from what is left over when we've spent our money on everything else? When we have made sacrifices, have we done it joyfully? Without any regret, just thrilled with the opportunity of sacrificing for something of eternal value. Understand, in these parables, the sacrifice was absolute. It was selling not just a little bit, but selling what? Everything to be able to invest in this thing of great value. Now notice, Jesus begins each of these parables by saying the kingdom of heaven is like this. Those in pursuit of the kingdom of heaven then would live like this. 
That's the implication. The Apostle Paul pulls the curtain back on his life and he says this, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing who? Christ Jesus my Lord. And he says, and I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count that but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. He pulls back his curtain, he says, in my life, that's a surpassing value, and I'll lose it all. And we look at his life, and he did. He, he left all the status and everything he, he had just to pursue this Jesus that he'd met. I love how the Apostle Paul then boasts about people who have made that same sort of sacrifice. And in the book of Corinthians, we find the Apostle Paul boasting about a group of Christians who had understood this. So he says, I wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given to the churches of Macedonia. Here's what they did, that in a great ordeal of affliction, there what? Read it abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their giving or their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, I love this phrase, they begged for the opportunity to sacrifice for the need. That's unheard of today that we would see a need and we say, well, no, I want to do that. Let me sacrifice. And these people who were doing it had no surplus to sacrifice. What were they sacrificing? They were sacrificing of their need for the kingdom work that was happening in some other believers and the meeting of a need there. It seems sometimes, church, as I think about our world, that somebody has come in and switched all the price tags. You ever notice that? The things that are of no value at all, our culture says, this is important. Spend your money on it. Spend your time on it. Sacrifice what you must to acquire this stuff that's worthless. And then there's this other part that's of great eternal value, Jesus Christ and his kingdom work, and in our culture it devalues that. It says that's nothing. You can do that when you're old, <laughs> when you don't have anything else to do. Priorities seem to be conflicted. We tend to prioritize the trivial over the significant, the unimportant over the very important and we've lost the connection between what we value as of great worth and our joyful response to pursue it and whatever sacrifice would be necessary to attain it. You know, throughout history, the kingdom of God has advanced because people, followers of Jesus, understood those concepts. The kingdom of God has advanced because believers in Jesus saw the worth of Jesus, saw the value of the kingdom of God, and with great joy they made huge sacrifices to see the kingdom move forward. When we were a short time over in Baker City, we were privileged to know a number of people that were part of uh, New Tribes Mission. There was a, a headquarters there. And, and there were these people who, they, their great desire, their joyful desire was to get rid of everything they had in order to go and take the kingdom message of Jesus to those tribes that hadn't been reached. They never did it begrudgingly. They were the most joyful people to be around. And what did they own? Not a thing. Because they were intent on that kingdom work. I dare say we have our priorities a bit upside down in conflict sometimes with the kingdom of God. I read a story about a man who was going to a Super Bowl game and he went to his seat and he noticed that there was a woman sitting next to an empty seat. And he commented to her that 
yeah, he, she was surprised there'd be an empty seat at the Super Bowl, and she said, well, that was my husband's seat, but um, he has died. And so he said, well, I'm so sorry about that, um, that your husband has died, but I'm still surprised that maybe another relative or a friend that wasn't here to enjoy the game. And she said, yeah, beats me. They all insisted on going to his funeral instead. Would you say her priorities were a little upside down? Would you say that? And it's one of those priorities that are upside down that we can laugh at. And yet it's sad when we value things of this world that are of no value and we miss the opportunity to sacrifice, to give joyfully, to pursue the kingdom of God freely. I want to remind you, uh, the book of Romans tells this. It says, whoever believes in him will never be disappointed. Our pursuit of Jesus will never end in disappointment. Our pursuit of other things in this world often ends in disappointment. Because we acquire it, we get it, we sacrifice for it, and then there's that, we've all experienced there's that moment where, gosh, this just isn't what I thought it would be. That passage goes on to say, whoever believes in him will never be disappointed for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all. Then it says abounding in riches for all who call on him. So may God help us, amen, to seek his kingdom first, to recognize the worth of Jesus, the value of his kingdom, to sacrifice joyfully whatever God would bring to us to sacrifice for the glory of Jesus himself. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let me pray and then uh, we're going to see some disciples of Jesus be baptized. Father God, we thank you for the truth of your word and how you speak clearly to us. Lord, as we prayed at the beginning, um, I pray that, that uh, you would not let your word leave us without bringing change and transformation. Lord, for whatever it is in our life, Lord, if we've got things upside down, if we've, we're pursuing the worthless and we're missing the valuable, Lord, help us to see that more clearly again today. Amen.